Good morning. This is episode 87 of uh, the Commandments of the New Testament. And uh, this morning we're going to be talking about uh, the tail end of uh, uh, the commandment, you shall not pray for your old man. You shall not pray for the flesh. Um, this is a tough one because uh, of all of the commandments about prayer, um, this is probably the the most difficult uh, for us. It's the difficult one for me. Um, the The problem is that that I grew up in the church, and I was taught that uh, you should pray for anything that you want. Uh, in fact, the Bible says that it says, "Pray for whatever you whatsoever you desire, and it uh, and it sh shall be given you." Uh, the problem is that uh, although the Bible does say that, and it does mean that, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, uh, there are other commandments that seem to indicate that God simply will not hear certain kinds of prayers. It's not what we do or how we hold our hands uh, in this case as much as what we are praying for. Um, the, uh, the question of uh, praying in and of the world, uh, uh, not of the world, uh, is something that we covered last week and last last time we got together. Uh, and here are just a couple snippets from it. First uh, uh, John three twenty two. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Um, what this is saying, of course, is that. Uh, in order for us to receive what it is that we are asking God for when we pray, we have to be obeying His commandments and doing the things that please Him. What are the things that please Him? And you know, I had all kinds of ideas growing up uh, uh, about what would please God. But the truth is, God's already told us what pleases Him, and uh, that's obedience to His commandments, which of course is uh, redundant on what he's already said because we obey his commandments. So last time we talked about the, the idea that, uh, that we're supposed to be praying in the world but not about the world, not of the world. Uh, we're not supposed to be praying for things that are fleshly in nature. That's a real tough one for me because I grew up praying for those things. I, I suspect that a significant portion of the contemporary Christian church prays for the flesh, prays for the things of the flesh. And we're told, no, don't do that. And it was Jesus that said it. So we're not supposed to be doing that. Uh, the New Testament uh, specifically says, and I'm paraphrasing now what we talked about last time, pleasure, vanity, wealth, ease, lusts, iniquity, pride, hypocrisy, and covetousness, being a friend to this world and the flesh is to be the enemy of God. Let me stop right there for a second. We talked about this enemy thing last time. Uh, I'd like to punch that one more time from a different direction. When we talk about spiritual warfare, you know that, that I've mentioned spiritual warfare in the past, and how the Bible simply does not teach us that spiritual warfare has anything whatsoever to do with Satan. Nothing. Every time warfare or uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, difficulties of any kind is mentioned in Scripture, we are the enemy. I am public enemy number one, not Satan. <clears throat> and this is a, another way of saying it. If we are in the world and of the world, then we are the enemy of God. If you are praying about the things of this world, you are the enemy of God. That's hard. That's tough. Well, I have to pray about food. No, we're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to pray about food. 
It says that uh, we don't pray about things like that because God already knows what it is that you need. Yes, sir. It's a good question. I don't know. We don't have, unfortunately, we are told more in the New Testament about hell than we are about heaven. Uh, the problem with both of those things is we don't know enough about them to speak to questions like that. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us what we're going to be doing in heaven. Uh, there are a lot of people who think they know they think that we're going to be walking along streets paved with gold and, and uh, so forth. And, and there'll be gates and, you know, Peter standing with a check, checklist at the gate, you know, the pearly gates kind of a thing. Um, that isn't heaven being described. In Scripture, that's the new Jerusalem on the new earth at the end of uh, uh, the heavens and the earth. God does away with them and, and uh, starts this whole new thing. We do know that during the millennial reign of Christ um, that happens after the tribulation, uh, it's a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth, we do know that there's going to be work going on. Uh, people will be fishing. Uh, people will be planting. People will be harvesting. Uh, people will be doing the same things that they're doing now. They'll be working. I guess the easiest way for me to to dispense with your question, excuse my putting it that way, what if the rapture occurred today, this afternoon? What if Jesus came back for his church? And yeah, <laughs> yay. Yes. Uh, if he did, then we would all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye in, in the clouds, and then we would be taken to heaven. Now, the tribulation lasts for seven years. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns with all of his saints. We return with him. We'll be wearing white tallets, white uh, 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 prayer shawls, and we will be riding horses. So if you don't know how to ride a horse, you learn now. Hang on just a second. <laughs> we return to the earth. There is no record anywhere in Scripture that we ever return to heaven. From then on, it says, we will rule and reign with Christ here a for a thousand years. Then, white throne judgment, we're passed through into the new Jerusalem on the new earth, and we continue to remain on the earth. So the question I've got for you is, how long will we spend in heaven? As long as we're here. No, no. If we have, if the rapture occurs today, this afternoon, and we're going to be returning to the earth from the heaven seven years later, the answer to the question is what? Yeah. Seven. seven years. Seven. So, so if it happens today, we would spend seven years in heaven and no more. So the real question shouldn't be, what are we going to do in heaven? The question is, what are we going to be doing in our new bodies? There are, there's reason to, to speculate on a lot of this stuff, and I would love to speculate on this stuff, but as a pastor, it's probably not in my purview. I'm supposed to talk about what God has said, not what I think. Um, and uh, that's kind of the, way, the reason that we do what we do here on Sunday mornings together. We're, we're looking at Scripture to find out what God has to say, not what Steve has to say. Um, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so uh, to continue uh, it, to be the enemy of God... Um, that, that's something that no Christian aspires to be, and yet we're told that that is spiritual warfare. My spiritual warfare is not casting out Satan, fighting against Satan, 
uh, my spiritual warfare is fighting against my own sin, my own weaknesses, my flesh. Now, it's true that following my entry into heaven, I will no longer be in sin. So spiritual warfare <laughs> apparently ceases once I get to heaven. But I don't think that prayer and or worship would cease. I don't think. But we just aren't told specifically about heaven or what comes after. I suspect that we will rule and reign with him because that's what it says. But I don't know... Uh, much about the, the religion of the end times. We can only speculate on that. Uh, so, to, uh, to be a friend of this world and the flesh, to pray about these things, is to become the enemy of God. And that's not something that we should aspire. Uh, and though you can pray for these things or make them possible, uh, God will refuse to even hear your prayer, let alone uh, grant it. So what's the point of praying if you're going to pray about the things of this world, this life? <clears throat> One final verse, and then we'll begin. Uh, this is also a review. Uh, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. We talked about this last time. Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man love the world, the love of, that is, for, the Father is not in him. You cannot have two masters. You cannot love God and mammon. You can't go there. So if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God, and vice versa. If you're a friend of God, then the world is your enemy. The world is your enemy. And we're not supposed to be praying that we will be better suited to to endure and be with and be friends with the enemy. The enemy is not the world. The enemy is not Satan. The enemy is me, my old man. So we're not supposed to be praying for our old man. We're supposed to be praying for our new man. It's tough. And frankly, I've thought a lot about this and I haven't come up with as many answers as I would have liked. But that was your homework, right? The homework from last time we got together was to decide what things that you used to pray for were for the flesh, were for this world, this old man that we used to be. <clears throat> I'd encourage you to continue to do that. Every time you pray, every time you pray, think about what it is that you're praying for. One of the things that I've been discovering through this study is that prayer, first of all, is done humbly and in fear of God. He's not my genie, our genie, which art in heaven. And we're not supposed to tell him what it is that we want. We're supposed to beg him for what it is that we want. So when I pray, my prayers have changed. My prayers are now going before the creator of the universe who spans the heavens with the span of his hand. Uh, I'm going before that God and I'm asking for something. And I'm doing it in humbleness and fear, not in pride of life, not because I deserve it, not because it's the promise and I'm, I'm asking based on the promise. I'm going there in the name of Jesus because I frankly have no right to step into God's spiritual throne room except in the name of Jesus. If you can imagine visiting the Queen of England and uh, walking into to her sitting room with her sitting there, um, what right do you have to do that? They'd probably arrest you, throw you in the brig, if you could get in that far. This is the creator of the universe. We have no right to go to him except that he's told us that we can. 
as long as we do it by following the rules. And the first rule is you do it in the name of Jesus. You do it in the name of the Son. That's your pass. That's the medallion that you wear when you walk in and the guards see it and they say, no problem. He belongs. But that doesn't give me the right to boss God around either and be flippant about my requests. <clears throat> if any man love the world, the love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not for the Father, but for the world. And those who do the will of the world will pass away, and the lusts thereof. But he that does the will of God abideth forever. So we want to do the will of God. What's the will of God? You know, <laughs> growing up, I wondered about that. I, my friends, my Christian friends would ask all the time they'd pray, God, just show me your will. Please, Lord, I want to know your will. That's what we're learning about. That's what this is all about. God has already told us what his will is, what he wants and what he doesn't want, what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do, the things that are pleasing to him and the things that make you his enemy. He's already told us. But we don't want to hear that. We want, we want the good stuff. We want the love, 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 love. We want the, the stuff that says, uh, uh, oh God, uh, show me what your will is for my, the perfect plan that you have for my life. Some of us would probably be horrified at what God's perfect plan is for my life. Um, that's probably why he doesn't tell you ahead of time. <laughs> uh, boot camp, boot camp. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Um, the third section of you shall not pray for your old man, and this is the final section too before we move on to the next commandment, uh, is God will ignore you. God will ignore you if you pray for the old man. Now, he said this over and over again. Um, if you pray for your flesh, not only do you become his enemy, but he will refuse to hear your prayer. Uh, the Bible goes so far as to say that he will be disgusted, he will turn his face away from you, and he will ignore your prayer. He will refuse to hear it. Now, listen, if God refuses to hear your prayer, how can he answer your prayer? And if he can't answer your prayer, because he has never heard it, he refuses to hear that prayer, then how can he say yes, let alone no? The purpose for our prayer is to change God's mind, to beg him to grant us a merciful answer. Have mercy on me, Lord. Think about, just for a second, what this could mean for me. And yes, I am a sinner. Forgive me, Lord, and consider my request. I would see it done this way. Please consider my request, Lord. And he says he will answer my prayer and give it to me. Now, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert here. There is a passage in Romans that says, that uh, many times we don't even know what we're supposed to pray for. We, we're we're kind of stupid that way. We're dumb about prayer. And we don't know what we ought to be praying for. And so the Holy Spirit will intervene. He will intercede between me and God, and He will rewrite my prayer. I'm paraphrasing here. <clears throat> And it says, he will intercede for us with God in groanings that cannot be uttered. Now, a lot of people think this is tongues. Uh, you've, you've heard people talk about 
uh, tongues in the church and, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, spiritual gift of tongues. That is not what this is about. How do I know that for certain? Because the Spirit will intercede with groanings that cannot be uttered. If you could utter them, then people could hear them. But they cannot be uttered. That's the whole point. And so if they cannot be uttered, nobody can hear them except God. What is that talking about? <clears throat> How many times when you pray, and you'll have to think about this because it's not immediately apparent. How many times when we pray are we asking God for the means to a specific end? Lord, I've got to have the money to pay my bills. I've got to have more work, Lord. Please send me more work. In doing that, what I'm asking for, now I'm not saying that's wrong, I, but what I am saying is what I'm asking in that case is for the means to accomplish what it is that I want to accomplish. What should I be praying for? Take care of my bills, Lord. <laughs> or, or better yet, uh, free me from the concerns that I have about these things. Take care of this for me, Lord. Isn't it possible that the Spirit will intervene with God at the moment and that God will not send you more work. Instead, He'll send you more money. Or He'll have those bills taken care of a completely different way. That's not the means, that's the end. So often when we pray, we are praying for the means rather than the end. And that's when the Spirit will intercede for us. God may decide he's, gonna, he's going to do it a completely different way than you're praying for, but it will achieve the same end that you're really asking for. You don't know how to pray for what you ought to be praying for, but the Spirit does, and the Spirit will intercede, and He will get you where you need to go. intercedes the intercession of the well he will groanings that cannot be uttered groanings that cannot be uttered you can search groanings if, if uh, you're of a mind to, to look that up for yourself groanings <clears throat> okay let's take our Bibles and turn to Job 27. Back in the Old Testament, Job 27. The question that we're addressing here is that God will ignore our prayers if we pray for things that he's told us not to pray for, specifically in this case for our old man, specifically for our flesh. In Job 27, <clears throat> Job's a big book. It's uh, before, <clears throat> pretty much just before Psalms. Job 27, 8, verse 8. Everybody there? <laughs> Job 27, verse 8. Got it? For what is the hope? of the hypocrite, though he hath gained when God taketh away his soul. What's a hypocrite? When you tell someone to do it, well, you, when you tell someone to, to not do something, but you do it. That's one definition. Another definition would simply be play acting. 
A hypocrite is somebody who says something and does something else. They put on a show of being that kind of person, but the truth is that in, in their works, they do something entirely different. Uh, there are lots and lots of Christians who on Sunday are really godly people. And then starting on Monday, you, you would never know it. These are hypocrites. <clears throat> what is the hope of the hypocrite? What's his hope? What is he doing this for? Though he has gained, God takes away his soul. Will God hear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call upon God? <clears throat> Will God hear him? And of course, the, the, the uh, response is, well, of course not. God will refuse to hear him. The idea is that God isn't going to hear the hypocrite. So don't be a hypocrite. Be sincere and be honest. If you're pretending to be a godly person, fix that so that you are what it is that you're pretending to be. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. When you present something or promise something, you do it. You obey God. Otherwise, you're a hypocrite. <clears throat> you say you're going to heaven, you say that you belong to Jesus, you say all of these things, but you don't live your life like that. This is a tough one. This is a hard thing, especially working workaday. You've got working workaday. You've got to you've got to put time in every day to make ends meet. You've got to work in this world just to get by. However, however, it can be done according to God's rules. It's a harder road than the easy road, which is to just let things slide until the following Sunday. But you're a hypocrite in the process. Don't be a hypocrite. <clears throat> Jesus said, don't choose the easy way, choose the hard way. The easy way leads to your destruction, hell. The hard way leads to heaven and God's kingdom. I'm not, I'm not getting what you're saying. If you go to heaven, does that mean that you're definitely going to go to a new earth? Apparently, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, apparently. Now, there are passages like Lord, Lord that scare the living daylights out of you. Uh, what you need to do is be careful not to be definite about these things because the Bible doesn't tell us. He's, there is no guarantee given to us that simply because we go to heaven for seven years that we are going to the new Jerusalem at the end of the thousand years, at the end of the millennium. <clears throat> the assumption is, well, of course we are. But the Bible doesn't say that. Satan fell from heaven. So there is a possibility of a, a well, Satan. falling could happen, but we just don't know if you trust God for all that. We don't have enough enough to go on. If to, you're if you're a hypocrite, you've right. got reason to be concerned, don't you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so live what it is that you're supposed to be living. Mm -hmm. Don't just play act. Don't just pretend. Don't just put on a good face. Don't put on airs. Don't be a hypocrite. Live what it is that you think you're supposed to be. Don't put on one face for some people 
and another face for other people. It amazes Sharon and I, we talk about this every once in a while, people that we know, we aren't on Facebook, by the way, but it's amazing to me how if you take somebody who you know, who's a good Christian person, and look up their Facebook page, it'll scare the living daylights out of you. These people are not what it is that they're showing to me. They, come, they go to church every Sunday. They say all of the right words. They say, you know, praise God, hallelujah. And all, and, but boy, on their Facebook page, they're a completely different person. It's almost like in order to be on Facebook, you got to tell the truth. What are they thinking? How, I, I, I know for a fact that the, one of the key tools of human resource departments in large corporations is Facebook. If you're looking for a, a job, a career style job, and you apply at a big corporation, you better not have a Facebook page. Or if you do, <laughs> it better match what it is that you're telling the recruiter. Because if it doesn't, they're not even going to call you back. <clears throat> Let's continue. <clears throat> Job 35. Now turn, let's turn over just a couple pages to Job 35. Verse 12. <clears throat> there they cry but none giveth answer because of the pride of evil men. You know, God tells us that he hates pride. Now, he's got a short list of things that he says, do not do this. You shall not do this. He's got a, uh, that's a long list, by the way, but He's got a certain short list out of those thou shalt nots that he hates. Specifically, <clears throat> there are about a dozen things given to us in Scripture that God truly hates. And one of those things is pride. Don't be proud. And if you find yourself being proud, if, uh, if you... Uh, uh, if you do something spectacular and people pat you on the back and say, hey, that's, that's cool. You did a great job and you smile and you beam and you, you walk around with your chest out, you know, and you're, you're talking about that to other people. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be proud. And if you find yourself slipping into that role, <clears throat> stop and ask for forgiveness. Because pride is not just a sin, it's one of the dozen odd things that God truly hates. Hates. If it matters to you what God thinks, then don't do that. Yes, sir? Is being proud of other people just as bad? You know, I've wondered about that myself. Pride is something that, that uh, uh, you can do about other people. I, it doesn't say that in Scripture. It just says pride, pride of life in many cases, the pride of life, because that happens. But I would have to think that any kind of pride, being proud of someone as well as being proud of yourself, constitutes a pride that God doesn't want in your life. He calls us to be humble and fearful. And that's how we're supposed to live our lives before him. Coram Deo, 
We're supposed to live in the presence of God, and he calls us to be humble, not proud, but humble and fearful. Humble and fearful tend to be the exact opposite of pride. Whether it's pride in someone else, uh, like some basketball star or some member of the family that does something spectacular, um, it's probably not a good idea to go there. Avoiding arrogance. Oh, and not just yours. Yeah. But don't nurture it in somebody else. Mm -hmm. I have wondered uh, during the last four or five years, <clears throat> and this is a new thought for me, and I don't have an answer for you. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, and don't take this to heart. Just think about it yourself. I'm wondering if as a community of Christians in the church, we don't do ourselves a disservice by fostering competition of any kind. By its definition, competition makes me better at the cost of someone else. I beat them. You know what I mean? You can't win a basketball game unless the other side loses. <clears throat> now, I'm not, I'm not saying take this to heart, do something about this. I'm just saying that this has suddenly occurred to me that maybe this isn't such a good idea. I don't see competitive sports being played in Scripture. I don't see people saying, well, you got to beat that other guy in order to get wealthy. Wealthy is not a praiseworthy thing in Scripture. Mm -hmm. The love of money is the root of all evil, it says. Paul spoke about <clears throat> running a race. And, you know, you're always trying to beat your own time when you're running a race. It's not really a competition, although they have skewed it that way. But I think it's more... You and God. I think, I think you're right. I think that the race that Paul is always talking about, the masteries, the masteries is, is how it appears in the New Testament. The masteries is not simply a race. The masteries is the Olympics. Now, if you're running a race, it's true that you want to win that race. That's the reason that you're in the race. Mm -hmm. But you can run the race to beat your own time. <clears throat> it means that you achieved something, and that's why I'm concerned about it. Well, I think that the achievement is your slaves are looking at your feet. You're running away from them. <laughs> yes, I'm rotating. <laughs> I, uh, I, I just I throw this out there for you all to think about this. It seems to me that our it's not just in the business world that we are competing with each other. It's not just in, uh, in an employee setting where we want to be a better employee, according to our boss, than any of the other employees. That's an unspoken and unjustified competition, but it happens a lot, doesn't it? Even among Christians. Even in the church, we compete, don't we? I want to be seen as the alpha dog when it comes to, you know, all of the all of the people there. I want to be the alpha Christian. You know, I want people. I want people to ask me about the Bible. You know, and all that stuff. No, don't go there because it it breeds pride. Uh, doesn't it say it says don't seek to have people call you Rabboni? Yeah, yeah. Don't we don't need another, more masters. Seek, seek another teacher, <laughs> another teacher, another teacher. Yeah. Well, even like when we're working out it's the kind of thing that it's really easy yes it is to okay well here this. Elizabeth completing my circle if she can do 25 <laughs> yeah. push-ups then I should you know I, or, or if Donovan can do this then, then no no because I'm gonna hurt myself now, I want to do what I can do and get better than I like I said I'm not I'm not saying that competition is there, there's a thou shalt not in Scripture. There isn't. Mm -hmm. It just occurs to me that competition flies in the face of 
being proud. It, it's, it fosters pride and arrogance, exactly the kinds of things God tells us not to do. So perhaps competition is something that we should be somewhat more concerned about. Even if we're sitting on the sidelines as a spectator, there are some people out there that just go a little too crazy about the team that they're watching, right? They paint themselves up and, and uh, they, they scream for their own team and they boo the other team whenever they make it a touchdown or a play or whatever it is. Spectator sports fosters pride and arrogance and enmity. And we, we, we get to the point where the, the ref was, he had to be bought off. You know, it, it's just, <laughs> the ref is a leader. He is there just like the leaders over us politically or legislatively or judicially. And God says he's the one who appointed these people. You do not criticize your leaders or face damnation. That's scary. How many Christians do you know will actually go to the point, go to the trouble of saying, oh man, we got to get this guy out of office? I think it's that old man tribalism and, you know, we all want a king. And that's, that's the old man. We don't, we don't go there. Yeah. God says, don't, don't criticize your leaders. Mm -hmm. I choose your leaders, mm -hmm. all of them. I'm the one that you should talk to. And frankly, when people hear you say something like this, their first question is, but how can God be responsible for Obama or whoever? <laughs> And my answer is sometimes God gives you what you deserve, not what you want. <laughs> and that solves the problem for them somehow. I'm not sure why, but that's, uh, it takes, you gotta, we've got to start working on ways to get the pride of life out of our life. And competition is maybe one of the ways that we do that. Get rid of competition so that we have one less thing to be proud about in our life. And it goes, it's amazing to me, all you've got to do is think about this for a while. Competition it has worked its way into every facet of our life. There are even people who compete on coupons at the grocery store. How much did you spend today? Well, I didn't spend hardly anything today. No, don't go there. Okay. Psalm 66, turn over a couple more pages, Psalm 66, verse 18, <clears throat> Psalms 66, verse 18, this one I've got highlighted in yellow in my Bible, you might want to do the same, it's uh, uh, this is an important verse. This is, this is one of the things that, that uh, uh, I, I call this emphatic. Emphatic is a $10 word that says, this says exactly what I needed to hear. In as few words as possible, God is not pussyfooting around on this one. He says exactly what we need to hear. Verse 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It doesn't get much clearer than that. What is iniquity? It's sin. It's disobedience. Disobedience to who? My mom and dad? Yeah, but that's not the, the main disobedience. It's because God told you to obey your parents. That's a commandment that God gave you. And that's why you obey your parents, because God told you to. And if you, don't dis if you disobey your parents, it's because... You disobeyed God. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What about speeding on the freeway? 
Man, I have such a hard time with that. <laughs> I, I, I know Steve must also, and Jennifer does, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, why do we obey? It, it really gripes me that I have to drive 18 out here at 35 miles an hour. <laughs> right? What's, what's the deal with that? And I, every time I do that, and then to top it all off, there's that Caltrans thing there where all the guys are either drinking coffee or asleep, and I'm paying for it, and that just makes mad. No, don't go there. Don't do that. I've got I've to stop doing these things too. I'm not perfect, and I'm not teaching you to, to do what I'm doing. I'm working on this too. The road, Highway 18, the sign that says 35 miles an hour, that's okay. It's not my road. And that's what I keep telling myself. It's not my road. Somebody else is who that road belongs to, and they're letting me drive it on the condition that I do it at 35 miles an hour or less. It's not a stupid law. It's not a stupid lawmaker. It's, there's no justification for that. I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And a lot of people do. And a lot of people get caught. And then they blame the policeman or the CHP. And God is probably up there just rolling his eyes and shaking his head. We've got to stop doing this stuff. If I even regard, it's notice that it doesn't say if I, if I uh, disobey. It says if I regard iniquity where, in my heart. If I even think this stuff, the Lord will not hear. I will not be able to get an answer to my prayer because God isn't even going to hear it. This is scary when you start thinking about it. Why do I even pray if God isn't going to hear me? How many, and as I go down this list, and you see the, the part of this list right here on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. This is just part of the list. If God has given us as Christians these commandments about prayer and said pretty much the same thing about all of them, if you do any of this stuff, if you disobey any of these commandments, I'm not going to hear your prayers. How many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of prayers are prayed every month all over the world that God simply refuses to hear? They're just a waste of time. When we pray, we're supposed to be praying succinctly. We're supposed to be praying in humbleness and fear. We're supposed to be praying carefully. Sharon and I were talking about it this last week, and, and I think that, that once you start thinking about these commandments long enough, you come to the conclusion that prayer is supposed to be a careful kind of a thing. I never understood this when I was growing up. I just prayed whenever and whatever I wanted to. God, please, you know, do, do this for me, God. I, I really, I'd really appreciate it if you'd do this. Wrong. That's not in humbleness or in fear. I said, please, that's not enough. That's not humbleness and that's not fear. Our prayers need to be deliberate. They need to be almost thought out before we pray them. God, Jesus is the one who said, don't repeat yourself in your prayers. Don't repeat yourself over and over again in a prayer. Don't say the same thing in different words over and over again in prayer. It's a waste of God's precious time is the, is the impression that you get. Jesus said, you're a hypocrite if you do this stuff. 
You wouldn't do this stuff to your boss or to your father. Why do it to me? The hypocrites do this, and then Jesus says, you know why they do this? The hypocrites repeat themselves in prayers because they think that if they repeat themselves, God will hear them better. You know what? God can hear anything He wants to. In fact, He knows what you're going to pray before you do. He's God. So don't pray a whole bunch of repetitions in each prayer that you pray. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't pray the same thing in separate prayers over time. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed three times for the same thing. Lord, let this cup pass from me. This is just before he was arrested and crucified. He prayed three times. There are other examples of other people who pray the same prayer on three different occasions. Three seems to be a special number for repetitions of a prayer. But within a prayer, don't go on, on, on over and over again repeating yourself. A perfect example of this is, is are the people who pray, especially in front of other people, Lord, please Lord, O oh Lord, hear my prayer, O oh Lord, uh, because Lord, I really need this Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen, Lord. Would you talk to any person that way? Oh, Steve. Thanks for coming, Steve. I appreciate it, Steve. The toilet's running, Steve. Can you take care of this for me, Steve? I appreciate it, Steve. Thanks, Steve. You wouldn't talk to a person like that. How can you think that this is a special way to talk to God, the God of the universe? And people do, don't they? Or they teach that in some of the seminary sense, but they teach it to Jesus. Or they spray to Jesus. Yeah, it makes it even better, doesn't it? Ah. You can't think of something to say. It's yeah. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Uh, yeah, if you if you say Jesus' name, that's a filler. It's almost like like we have to we have to be profound when we pray, especially when other people are listening. But of course, that's wrong. Why? Because suddenly our prayer has become horizontal. Our audience is the people who are listening, not the creator of the universe. That's why Jesus said at the tail end of all of this is don't be like the hypocrites. You hide yourself in your prayer closet and you pray in secret and your father who will hear you in secret will reward you openly. That's almost a commandment right there, isn't it? Now, this does not negate the possibility of communal prayer. There are several instances in the New Testament where a lot of Christians will get together and they'll pray together communally. That is, they're, they're, uh, they're interceding, they're praying all of them for the same kinds of things all at the same time. It's a community prayer kind of a thing. That's not necessarily a bad thing. The problem is that it lends itself to all kinds of misuse and abuse. It lends itself to, well, Lord, I know that uh, 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 Steve's mom is uh, hitting the sauce, and and you know, <laughs> and, and or uh, boy, those those people over there, they really like the Elks Club, and we got to pray for them because they're just a bunch of drunks over there, and it's it's gossip. It degenerates from a prayer into gossip. And this is the way you share juicy details about somebody with other people in the guise of prayer. And once again, your audience is horizontal rather than vertical. It also fosters all kinds of other problems communal prayer does. And that is that you've got to be profound when you pray. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh... Lord, I don't know what to pray for, but you know, <laughs> just help me. Instead, people are more likely to say, Oh, Lord, you know, <laughs> yeah, yes, and uh, 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 hear our prayer, oh, Lord, you know, I like 
Lloyd Ogilvy. <laughs> Lloyd Ogilvy, I love the guy. He's got the, this incredible voice. And, and uh, when he preaches a sermon, it's just, it's like music. He's got this deep voice and it just rumbles and you just feel, oh, you know. But of course, he doesn't talk to God like that. <laughs> just me, just, just you know, the, his, his congregation. Don't fall into the trap of praying in front of other people because the temptation is to pray something profound that they will think of as profound. They want, I, you want them to think well of you. So your mind goes to them rather than to God. All right, Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's one of the reasons why, folks, at the beginning of your prayer, you might get into the habit of asking for forgiveness. Because no man is without sin. All of us sin, especially when you consider that sin happens up here in your head, whether it happens in your heart, whether it happens in your hands or not. Anger, lust, covetousness, all kinds of things can happen in your head and never reach your hands. And all of those things are sin. So fix it before you pray, and that way you won't have to worry about whether God is listening or not. He will hear your prayer if you follow the rules. But truly, God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. God's going to turn away your prayer. So start your prayers with, please forgive me, Lord, for my sins. Now, you don't have to enumerate, I don't think, every sin. But I think it is a good idea, not for God so much as for me, for me to start off by talking about the categories of sin that I'm probably guilty of, whether I can identify them specifically or not. Lord, I know that I've had problems with covetousness, wanting things that I don't already have. I'm not content with the things that you've given me. Uh, Lord, I, I'm, I'm proud, I'm arrogant. I, I, and, and, you know, go through all of the, the things that you know about yourself. It will bring to mind other things about yourself, too, <laughs> that you haven't thought of before. And it will help you in repentance. It'll help you to try to fix those things, which is the point of it all. Psalm 109, 7. Psalm 109, verse 7. <clears throat> when he shall be judged... Are you, okay, I'll wait... Psalm 108, uh, 109, verse 7. Okay, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Uh, we're talking about the wicked man here, that's the context. The wicked man. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. A wicked man's prayer, the prayer itself will become sin. Not just the things that causes God to turn away his face and not hear your, your prayer, but the prayer you pray becomes a sin. There are lots and lots of commandments. And especially in the Old Testament, there's a lot of commandments given to the Jews by God. Among these commandments, there are three groups. There are the commandments that if you do these things, they are sin. So you don't do these things, you obey the commandments. 
Then there's a special group above that of terrible sins. These sins are called the abominations of the Lord. These things are so disgusting to God that it that he just he just can't abide them. They're disgusting. They are abominable to him. And then within the abominations, there's a small group of sins that are so extremely bad, they're called land crimes. Land crimes. They are sins not just against God, but against the land itself. And God warns you that if you allow these sins to be committed in your land, that the land will ultimately vomit you out of itself. The land will take retribution on you. Now, I'm not sure how that works, but it worked for the Jews. God brought all kinds of problems against the Jews, the chosen people. All of their problems came from God. Have you ever thought about that? All of the bad things that the Jews suffered were the result of God's judgment, his chastisement. Could God have prevented all of the bad things? You bet. When an enemy attacked, God brought that enemy to punish the Jews. Remember Pharaoh in Egypt? He wanted to several times to, to let the people go. Let's just get this over with, and God hardened his heart. He wasn't ready to let the people go. He wanted to make sure that they got all ten plagues in. That's another story. That's for Passover. But uh, to continue here, let's go to Proverbs 15, 8 and 9. Proverbs, the next book over. Proverbs 15, verse 8. Proverbs 15, verse 8 and 9. Everybody there? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. This is one of the abominations. What is a sacrifice? Well, people often think of a blood sacrifice, uh, and we don't do that anymore. Uh, but, but we have also been told, especially in the New Testament, that our sacrifice is praise. The sacrifice of praise. So when we praise God, think about this now. When we praise God, and we're in iniquity, we're in wickedness, we're in sin. It's an abomination. It's not just a sin. It's not just that God is not going to hear it, not going to appreciate it. It's an abomination. It's disgusting. A cockroach in your mouth. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. God loves the prayer of the upright. That's why we ask for forgiveness first thing. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he that loveth God, uh, he, he, God loveth him that followeth after righteousness, who desires to be righteous in God's eyes. Now, I know I'm a sinner, <clears throat> and when I ask God to forgive me, I ask God to make me white and clean and precious in His sight. Not that I've suddenly become perfect, but because God has the power to see me any way He wants to. He will forgive me in His mercy. And the provision for my forgiveness was made in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Now, once I'm forgiven and I'm clean, I've got to hurry and make my request, my prayer. Get it done quickly before you have an evil thought. 
right? Before you take pride in anything, before you mistakenly uh, uh, turn your prayer horizontal, even for just a second, or while you're praying to God, you think about something that you shouldn't be thinking about. Get it done quick. Ask for forgiveness and pray your prayer in righteousness. And then, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, by the way, is just an old Hebrew word that means so be it, so be it. Or in common parlance, you could say the end. Amen means the end, or so be it. So let it be written, so let it be done. <laughs> okay, um, Proverbs 21, 27. 21, 27, just turn over a couple pages. 21, Proverbs 21, 27. <clears throat> this is the same passage, isn't it? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? with a wicked mind. Uh, it says the same thing in 28.9. We won't go there for the sake of time. Uh, let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. What's interesting in the Hebrew, it says a false witness for the wicked mind. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15. Isaiah, it's after Psalms and the little, the little books of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, and, and it's right after a Song of Solomon. Isaiah 1, 15. Got it? Verse 15, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil from your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Speak judgment. Relieve the oppressed. That's, you know, give to the poor and needy. Do things that help people who are in trouble. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And it goes on. The point is, all you've got to do is ask, and God will forgive. Ask for God to forgive you, and he can, and he will. It's so easy to do, but there are an awful lot of Christians out there that don't. They've got it in their heads that that's what they did when they came to Jesus. They asked for forgiveness, and now they don't need to ask for forgiveness anymore. It was once for all. Micah 3.4. Now, this one's harder to find because Micah is a little book. It's right after Jonah, which is also a little book, and just just before Habakkuk, which is an even littler book, Micah. Chapter 3, verse 4. The next Bible you get is going to have tabs in it, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> have we heard that? Yes. Micah 3 4. 3 4.
Micah 3, 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. God is not about to put up with sin. He will not hear you. He will hide his face from you. He'll turn and walk away from you. You know, I was told by Sunday school teachers growing up in the church that uh, God will never leave you or forsake you. There's a passage of scripture that says that. God will never leave you nor forsake you. That means that God doesn't leave you. When there's distance between you and God, it's because you walked away from God, not because he walked away from you. On the other hand, God says if you are in sin, unrepented sin, he will turn his face away from you. He will not hear your prayers. It's an abomination. And he won't put up with it. John 9.31. This is another big one. John. The Gospel of John. Where's that? Yeah. <laughs> no, not as bad as Micah. <laughs> yeah, John 9.31. Um, let's see here. You'll probably want to, to highlight this verse. I've got it highlighted in green. The whole verse. John 9, 31. In green, with your green highlighter, if you've got one. Or underline it, or whatever you want. Nine thirty one. Now this is the New Testament. All of the passages we've read so far are in the Old Testament. But I wanted to show you that it's not just in the Old Testament that God says this. In the New Testament, he says exactly the same thing. In John 9.31, it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. God will hear you if you obey his commandments, doing his will, and if you worship him. The thing that's scary about that is that nobody in the church today seems to know what worship is. They think they're doing that every time they sing a song. This is praise and worship time, everybody. If they really knew what worship was, they'd realize that God isn't going to hear their prayers unless they are a worshiper of God. A lot of people will perform worship of God before they pray. Now, at the very least, worship, and we've talked about worship before, but at the very least, it's prostration. Prostration doesn't necessarily involve laying flat on your face on the ground. You, there are many examples in Scripture where they simply bow deeply with their face parallel, their face parallel to the ground. You can do this sitting in a chair, can't you? You can bend way over. You can close your eyes in worship, but worship is silent. Worship is focused on God, not on you. This isn't about you. Worship is unique because unlike prayer, it's not about you. It's about God alone. It's homage. It's, it's meditation, if you will. It's focused on Him and who He is and what he is. That's worship. And it's not happening in worship services all over the world this morning, is it? Because they don't know what it is. And God won't hear their prayers if they aren't a worshiper of God. Wow. Many will come. 
James 5.15. James, way back, almost to Revelation. If you hit 1st, 2nd Peter, you're, you've gone too far. Uh, almost all the way back, right in front of Revelation, James. Right in front of Peter, yeah. James. After Hebrews, Hebrews isn't quite far enough. James is an incredible little book. Incredible little book. Lots of truth there. James 5, 15. Got it? Everybody there? I'll wait, Doreen. James 5, 15. We're getting a lot of hail this morning, aren't we? Now there are, I've talked about these tabs before. This is, uh, this can be a big help. If you've got a, uh, if I, I've got a red tab in my Bible that stays here all the time. This is the end of Revelation. I put it right there. I used to have a tab uh, right where, Matt, between Matthew and, and Malachi, it's where the Old Testament meets the New Testament. And, uh, um, and then you can uh, rely on your table of contents, too. There's a table of contents in front of all of your Bibles. Um, finding it sometimes is just as difficult as finding James. But, <laughs> but you could put a tab there, too. And that way, when somebody says, turn to Habakkuk 13, <laughs> which there is none of, of course, um, you can... Um, uh, you can find Habakkuk relatively easy by page number. Did you find James up there? I found James. James chapter 5, 15. verse 15. Right at the end of James, actually. Okay, James 5, 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults, your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you might be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I've got that sentence in green. Highlighted in green, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual means, according to the rules, fervent means in humbleness and in fear, passionate, of a righteous man forgiven. You either obey or you repent, and that makes you righteous. 
and that prayer availeth much. Wouldn't you like your prayers to availeth much? I, like, I would like to know that, uh, that God is hearing my prayers. But there are rules. There are rules. Let's, uh, let's call it a day. And, uh, and sing our closing prayer. I put the words once again on the screen. Okay, let's pray this together in song. <clears throat> I love you, God, and I lift my voice in Jesus' name. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Forgive me, Lord. And my prayer, please pray. Street welcomed song in your ear. Yep, we'll get it. I'll get it eventually, anyway. <laughs> Amen.